everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. Every week, a new guest is here to share their photography and experiences behind the lens. They'll share their stories and expertise to inspire you to create better images and improve your own photography portfolio. Upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to my YouTube channel and our community blog. From the southern tip of Texas, Elaine Pruden is here to help monitor the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Say hello, Elaine. Hello, everybody. My guest tonight is Ben Cowan. Ben is a trained marine biologist who has been shooting underwater since 1986, long before he ever started taking pictures on land. His diving trips include Mexico, the Cayman Islands, Palau, and the Red Sea, just to name a few of the exotic locations that he has explored. In tonight's presentation, Ben will describe how the conditions underwater affect light and movement, and how those affect everything from exposure to composition to technique. Ben will also discuss the kinds of cameras and equipment needed to shoot underwater, and basic considerations for scuba diving and dive travel. So welcome to the Happiness Hour, Ben. Thanks, Linda. All right, so you and I have talked and I, we've actually met. So uh, that's kind of one of those full disclosures of, of you know, how, how do I pick my speakers? Well, um, Ben has been coming to a lot of the Happiness Hours and um, in conversation one day, he, he mentioned I do diving and, you know, if, if I was interested in having somebody do um, underwater photography, he'd be, he'd be up for that. And I thought, <laughs> I will never say no to anyone that wants to do a presentation here. So I jumped on that and, um, and then Ben and I just over conversations through our Instagram feeds. Um, he's also a birder. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, he was explaining to me, you know, spring, spring migration is, is kind of crazy on the Gulf Coast, which I knew, but I just had never really taken the time to go out there. And so it kind of worked out. I had a free uh, Saturday. And so we met up in, um, and I'm gonna mispronounce it, but it's Quintana. Uh, it's kind of a bird sanctuary um, on just, uh, is it south of Galveston Island? So Ben's out there, uh, and and you know he's pretty much hollering out what bird is in front of me, which was really helpful because all I see is blue or yellow or you know I I started calling all the yellow birds peeps. So that's my extent of my my bird knowledge, but I'm getting better. But tonight you're going to hit me up with um, some information on what to do underwater. And I had to confess to him that I'm not a swimmer. In fact, I don't, I very rarely go into the water. So um, then this is really going to, it falls on your shoulders to, to entertain us and educate us tonight because I have nothing to contribute. So thank you for being here and thank you for being willing to, to share what you know. Yeah, so yeah. with that, I'm going to pass it to you. Oh, thanks for um, thanks for having me, Linda. And I, as you said, I've been um, coming to these happiness hours for uh, several months now, and I always um, uh, find them interesting and um, love learning new things. And even when they're not the kind of photography that I've ever done before or see myself doing, it's, I think it's always interesting. And um, I think underwater photography probably fits that category for a lot of the folks here. Um, uh, probably not something that many folks have done. Um, and, uh, this should be completely different from the normal kind of images that we see. And, but I thought that might be interesting to folks to see what's, you know, just how different it can be. Um, you know, just by way of a little bit of background, um, of me, I, um, as Linda said, I started scuba diving actually in 1985. Um, and I was not a photographer back then. I was a teenager. Um, but I just sort of fell in love with, um, with the coral reefs and, and all the incredible, uh, wildlife and diverse biodiversity that I was seeing. And I was like, I've got to document this. And so, um, I started, uh, you know, saved up my money and bought a camera, had no idea what I was doing. 
Um, but a year later, um, on a family dive trip, I sort of took an underwater photography class. And that's really where I learned the basics of photography. Um, and uh, from then on, I did a lot of dive trips uh, with my dad, who was very into scuba and, um, and over the years just you know, kept working on it and kept learning. And um, I exclusively did underwater photography until probably about 15 years ago. So that's all I knew. Um, and so for me, learning how to shoot photographs on land was, you know, just completely opposite in a lot of ways. Um, so I think hopefully it'll be, it'll be interesting to folks to see just kind of what those differences are. And I'll, um, and, and also too, I'll, I'll mention, I, I loved it so much. I actually went to college and got my degree in marine biology, marine affairs, and, and I now, you know, do um, endangered species work. So this is um, something I fell in love with early on. And um, I'm, I'm definitely a, not just a bird nerd, but, but fish nerd and every other kind of nerd. Yes. Okay, great. So um, I guess just by way of introduction, right? As I said, everything is different underwater. Um, light even behaves differently underwater. Your cameras uh, behave differently underwater. The wildlife is very different underwater. And um, even you are different underwater. There's just you know certain basic things you're you don't think about on land that you have to be very cognizant of underwater. And so we'll talk about how each of these things affects um, photography um, as we go through uh, this talk. So just some very basic um, information about diving. First of all, you obviously need to be scuba, scuba certified um, before you start taking pictures underwater, unless you're really good at holding your breath. Uh, getting scuba certified is actually much easier than you think. Um, you do need to be able to swim to pass some basic swim tests. But beyond that, this is not a, you know, some sort of um, extreme sport. Um, there's plenty of people who come to it uh, very late in life, um, often in their 50s, 60s, even 70s. Um, and my dad is um, in his 80s and is still actively scuba diving. Um, we went to Little Cayman a couple of years ago for his 80th birthday for a dive trip. Uh, it's, it, it's, not a, it's not very strenuous um, and it's really easy once you, once you learn it. Um, so if it's something you think you might have an interest in, um, don't be scared off. Um, but a couple of things you do need to know, uh, particularly if you're interested in getting into photography, is first of all, um, you know, one of the things you'll learn in um, your certification class is neutral buoyancy, right? You, you have what's called a buoyancy compensator is one of the pieces of equipment you wear. That's kind of what your, your tank is strapped to. And that helps you maintain neutral buoyancy. So you are essentially weightless underwater. Um, it takes a little bit of time to learn. Some people are more natural at it than others, but um, you need to master your buoyancy before you should start, you know, trying to take photographs. Because first of all, if you're, you know, if you have trouble with it, you'll be, you know, floating up, you'll be sinking down, and you'll be more focused on trying to sort of stay still and stay in one place, um, and you can't focus on, um, on your photography. It's also, um, you know, it means you could be bumping into the reef um, or your buddy or things. And it's, and so for purpose of conservation, it's really important that you master your, your buoyancy. Um, air consumption is also really important. New divers tend to, you know, be excited and breathe more quickly. Um, it's really important underwater to breathe deep and slow, um, both for, you know, your own health, but also to make your, your air last. Um, you know, you generally have on a dive, on a deep dive, you might have 30 minutes of air on a longer dive, maybe an hour. So you're on the clock when you're underwater. Um, and for photography, that means, you know, you need to have a plan when you go down um, and you need to be um, really focused on, on what you're doing. You don't have a lot of time to, to waste. Um, Body awareness is really important. This sort of goes along with neutral buoyancy. Um, you have to know where your, your, your feet and your legs are and your fins that you're wearing, which extend your feet by a foot or two. Um, you'd be surprised how many people are out there and just don't really uh, have any idea sort of where their limbs are or their gauge is hanging down. 
Um, but it's really important, um, certainly so you don't kick up sand and ruin the visibility, but most importantly um, is we have to protect the reefs uh, and, and the underwater life and bumping into them, kicking them, you know, you can really do a tremendous amount of damage. And, you know, a sad fact of the matter is that throughout the Caribbean and many, um, you know, very popular dive destinations throughout the world um, have visibly deteriorated because of the pressure of so many divers um, on a daily basis. So um, that's something I urge people not to take up photography until you really are in control of your buoyancy and your, and your body awareness. Um, of course, also important diving is um, the buddy system, having a buddy on your dive that you're with. Um, you, most recreational diving is also with a group and a dive master. So you have to be keeping up with the group and with your buddy um, in order to um, stay with the group and not um, get lost. You need underwater navigation skills, which you learn in your certification class so that you always know where you are and know how to find people. Uh, and then um, lastly, I know it's something we all suffer from above water, but certainly underwater, it's even more pronounced is, is viewfinder vision. Um, you can be so busy looking at, particularly because you're wearing a mask, um, so you don't have great peripheral vision to begin with. Um, and then when you're looking at everything through your camera lens, um, you need to turn around. You need to kind of make it a point to look at what's around you and see, um, see the reef, see the, the water column. Um, I've you know, we all suffer from it. Um, when I was in the Solomon Islands uh, on a dive, I came up and was told that there was a manta ray that swam like 10 feet behind me and I never even saw it um, just because I wasn't looking around, I was too focused. So all some things to be mindful of, um, you know, when you, when you get into it. Um, so we'll start with talking about um, some of the equipment that, um, you know, what kind of camera do you use underwater? Um, there's basically three different categories, as I would call them. Um, the first and what I started with and what many people started with back in the day um, is a dedicated underwater camera system. Um, so um, anyway, I started with a dedicated underwater camera and really, there, you know, there was no Canon option. There wasn't, Sony wasn't making cameras back then. It was really just Nikon, which is why to this day, I'm still a Nikon shooter. Um, but Nikon had a venerable system called the Nikonis system. And the Nikonis 5 was really the one that really brought underwater photography to the masses. Um, it um, it is, was a rangefinder camera, and this is sort of what it looked like. Um, so this was not an SLR. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor on the screen, but really you were looking through this just viewfinder straight through. And your lens had, um, you know, aperture control and then depth of field markings. And that's really how you, um, what you did. So you'd be looking at, you know, the front of your camera to set your, your, your focal distance and, and your f-stop. Um, it did, it was interchangeable lenses though. So um, you could get extension tubes here, um, but because it was a rangefinder, they had to actually have a bracket. Um, to tell you exactly how far, because your depth of field was essentially a few millimeters on either side of the bracket, um, which of course made it very hard to take a picture of anything um, that was mobile that did not want to be framed that way. Um, there was also an excellent, optically excellent lens, a 15 millimeter lens um, that they made, which so you had to have a separate um, viewfinder for that. Um, Everyone, you know, wanted Nikon to make a DSLR, uh, I'm sorry, an SLR um, for underwater, which they eventually did. It was called the, Ni the Nikonis RS. Um, and, but it was incredibly expensive. It was, I think, five or $6,000, which 30 years ago was a lot of money. Um, and uh, it never really caught on. It was kind of buggy, but it was the one and only sort of SLR autofocus camera ever made. Um, but, uh, really this was obviously, these were all film cameras. Um, they're no longer available. Uh, you know, they've gone the way of the dinosaur. I still have mine. It never flooded and it still works perfectly well, but, um, film is not really the medium we use these days. 
Um, so there really now are no dedicated underwater cameras, um, but there was a lot that you could do with this system, despite it being sort of a pretty simple rangefinder system. And I'll just show you a couple images um, that I took with my Nikonis. This was with um, the standard lens with a close-up kit in the Red Sea. Um, uh, it's called a Clark Eye clownfish and a bubble coral. Um, so you could really do some nice um, work with it. This was a photograph I took at night. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about night diving, but that's a whole nother realm to explore. Um, but again, with sort of the close-up kit, um, you know, really nice, um, you know, nice sharp. Uh, the lenses were very good, um, but it was hard to take pictures of, of fish um, with it. it. Getting fish portraits was difficult. This is sort of one that I took with my Nikonis, but looking through my catalog, I have very few fish pictures just because with a rangefinder camera, um, it's a pretty hard thing to do. Um, it was great for wide angle though. Um, this was a photograph taken with the 15 millimeter lens. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll talk about the lighting um, in a little bit, but really um, I love um, doing wide angle photography with the Nikonis system um, because you have, um, so much uh, with with the 15 millimeter lens and then a 12 millimeter fisheye lens that I that I got for it. Um, you know these ultra wide lenses have you know, great depth of field, which um, is really great underwater. Because number one is we'll talk about you have to get very close to your subjects, um, and so being close and having that great depth of field, um, as, uh, where you can have your foreground and background all in focus, was really um, really a lot of fun. This is another example. This one taken with the 12 millimeter fisheye lens where I was probably about three to four inches from these sea whips um, and still able to get, you know, the entire, this sea whip coral was probably about a five or six foot tall coral um, and really able to be within inches of it and yet get the whole thing uh, in frame and in focus. Um, so, uh, in today, though, as I said, not, you know, old, not going to use an old Nikonis film system. Um, so there's really two options. The first and the one that you know is really more of the entry level option is a housed compact camera. Um, and so this generally, you know, talking about um, models with a one inch sensor. Uh, and the two that are really most widely used are the Canon PowerShot G7X. I think it's like on Mark III right now, and the Sony RX100. Um, they're really small and compact, which is certainly nice in terms of the amount of the size of the gear you're schlepping. Um, there is a small but um, good, you know, decent selection of housings and ports for it. And um, you know, not only do these cameras have a built-in zoom, which is nice, but um, they there are wet lenses available where which are sort of lenses that can attach to your port so you can actually change lenses underwater, um, which is a really neat um, and unique feature. Um, so it's a really good way to get into it. These cameras probably cost in the $800 to range, maybe up to $1,000 for the cameras. I mean, they're really incredible little, little cameras with excellent lenses. Um, and, uh, and then you have to buy the housing for it. Um, and lighting and so forth. So you're probably going to be looking at at least two to three thousand dollars, you know, if you're starting a system from scratch. But that's a lot less than than a DSLR. Um, you know, there's a slight compromise on image quality, less so because of the lenses on the cameras themselves, but more so because of the ports um, and the and particularly if you're using the wet lenses for the um, for the flexibility. You know that does give you a thin layer of water in between, and so I'll, I'll show you in a minute here how that manifests itself. Um, you know, focusing on the cameras is not as great as the autofocus on an SLR. Um, so you have a little less flexibility, a little less creative control, um, but still can do some wonderful, um, take some wonderful images with it. This is um, the system that I have when I got back into um, underwater photography uh, about probably about five years ago, I sort of 
had kids and hadn't been able to do a lot of diving and travel. And um, so I didn't do any underwater photography for 10 or 15 years. And that's when I got into land-based. But when I got back into it, I, I had the, the Canon PowerShot G7X. And so I got this housing for it by a company called Icolite, which is well known in the industry. And you can see it's basically a clear plastic um, shell um, with an O-ring seal on the back and you know little buttons and levers and dials to operate all of the buttons through the housing. Um, and then this is uh, an example of one of the wet, lens wet lenses that will screw on on top of the flat port. Um, and this is a diopter that you can screw on top for doing macro work. So you really have great flexibility from real wide angle to macro and everything in between. Um, this is an example of, this is just with the standard lens. Um, uh, you know, much easier to shoot fish because you've now got autofocus and you also have a little bit of a zoom. Um, I think the power shot is a 28 to, to 100, uh, which is a pretty good range for underwater. And, uh, you know, let me get um, the Moray Eel, um, you know, pretty sharp um, and, you know, well lit. Uh, you know, again, a little more flexibility for fish um, in motion. This is a school of goat fish um, on, um, actually what that is on the right is, is a coral growing station um, in Bonaire. Um, but, you know, fish tend to move a lot, <laughs> even more than warblers. Um, so having good autofocus system and a camera that's easy to handle um, is helpful. Uh, now this is an example of some wide angle, uh, a wide angle shot taken with my compact system. And you can see it's really sharp in the middle, but you drastically lose corner sharpness. You can see up here, um, you, it's really starting to be distorted and, and down here, even in the foreground where it should be in focus. And that's really a function of um, the way, what it actually does is the camera is actually focusing on the, the image that is on the dome port. Um, and it just loses, um, it just loses sharpness in the corners. So you have to sort of be aware of that and compose your, your image in a way that it's not really noticeable. Um, this is another example of it. And you can see where like here, you don't really notice that, you know, the bottom right and left corners are a little bit, you know, distorted and blurry because that's just not where, um, you know, not where the eye, you know, the eye is directed to the sponge in the foreground and the, and the um, schooling Creole wrasse in the back. Um, but that is a limitation of the system. Um, but it's great for fish, like I said, and for close up work. Uh, this is a frogfish in Bonaire. Um, if you've never heard of a frogfish, they're just, I mean, they basically look like sponges. Um, it's frankly very hard to see them, even when you're looking straight at them, because they blend in so incredibly well. Um, and that's sort of their, that's their MO. Um, they're sometimes called anglerfish, because if you see here, this little appendage has then has like a little feather on the end of it, um, a little worm. And it's, it's a lot like a cat toy that you might use to get your cat interested. Well, they, they sort of wiggle this little appendage and shake this thing and small fish sort of see it. They think it's a worm or something and they're, they come up, you know, they think it's food. And then the frogfish, his mouth will open to about the size of his body. And they'll just, in the blink of an eye, so they open their mouth so fast it, creates a little vortex, sucks the fish in, and then they sit right back down. It's, it's a neat thing to see. They're a really cool um, kind of fish. Um, you can see their, their pectoral fins have sort of evolved into almost like limbs to walk on. Um, you don't see frogfish swimming around. You know, they'll, they might swim a few feet at a time to get to a new spot. They settle in and they disappear. Um, real neat kind of thing. Um, and this is an example of, you know, some of the real macro work that you can do. Um, this is with the diopter on the standard lens. Um, and uh, this is what's called a head shield slug. Um, you can tell, like, this is just a little bit of, of algae, um, but you can see by the grains of sand, these are literally, you know, grains of sand. You can see how tiny this thing is. It's probably a quarter inch long to a half inch. And so I was able to get you know, 
great magnification on it. Um, super sharp. You obviously don't have a lot of depth of field, um, but that's kind of neat uh, effect. And, um, you know, this was just a little, th there was actually sort of hundreds of these little guys on this sand bottom um, in, the, in this patch reef area that we were. And if you were just looking at them, you just thought they were just little black bits of whatever. You wouldn't even think they were um, an animal until you look real close. And um, we'll talk about lighting, but, um, you know, when you get the artificial light on them is when the colors really pop. So some really great stuff. And I have a lot of fun shooting um, with my compact system. You just got to sort of know the limitations of it. But, um, you know, for people looking to get into the hobby, it's, it's, it's a great way um, to get started without the investment of a house system, of a house DSLR system. Um, of course, a house DSLR is the gold standard. Um, and it literally is taking your, whether it's, I have a D500 that I shoot with, um, or, you know, a lot of people might have a D850 or the, or the, the Canon version of it. Um, uh, now mirror, mirrorless cameras, there's, there's pretty much any sort of pro enthusiast or professional body, there are housings made for it now. Um, and so you can take your existing camera and put it in a housing. Um, and use that. So you're using all your existing lenses and all of that. So um, you may think that, you know, that, hey, that's going to be even more cost effective um, because I already own the camera and the lenses, but <laughs> the housings themselves generally cost three to four thousand um, dollars. The ports cost a flat port will be six hundred to eight hundred dollars. A dome port, um, which you need for wide angle, you know, might be a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. Um, so, um, and then that housing that you just spent, you know, probably four to $5,000 on the housing and accessories and so forth only works for that specific camera model. Um, and, uh, you upgrade your camera, you need a whole new housing. And so it's expensive. You have to, um, you have to really be committed to you and love your camera and know that you're going to use it a lot to justify it. Um, there are also... It's, it's big, it's bulky because you've got your full-size camera and a full-size housing. Um, and they are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're complex. Um, and there's a lot of pieces, the, the ports and the housing. Um, this gives you an idea what they look like. So this is the Aquatica housing. I used to have a, I had an Aquatica N90S, which was a film SLR that I shot with for a long time in an in Aquatica housing much like this. And you can kind of see it's, it's definitely a bigger, heavier duty, you know, aluminum housing. So it's heavy, um, much bigger than the, you know, the, the plastic housing for the compact system. Um, all these, you know, little buttons let you operate everything. The one thing you can't operate is a touch screen. Um, this is kind of the inside. You can see sort of how complex they are, which is part of why they're so expensive, that and the water ceiling. Um, and then this is a flat port, which you would need for macro, which would go onto the front here um, and a dome port for a wide angle lens. Um, so it's a pretty substantial system. It's, it's basically traveling with it as a whole nother suitcase um, and it's a lot of weight. So it's, I have not invested in a housing for my D500 just because I figure I, I need to wait till my kids are out of college and I'm doing more diving or something to justify it. But you can do obviously amazing stuff with the house system. Um, this is um, taken with my N90S, so SLR, not DSLR, back in the film days. A lot of what you'll be seeing today is from, um, from when I was shooting on film. Um, but you could never get this photograph with a different kind of system just because these fairy basilets, they're called, are very small, constantly moving, um, skittish. Um, and so you really need... A, this is taken with a five millimeter lens. Um, you really need good lens, um, good autofocus, and that's what you get with, um, you know, in, with, a, with a house system. Um, same thing here. This is a, a conger eel. It's called a garden eel. Um, th these will generally go into the sand when you get within about 15 feet of them. I had to sort of gradually, over about five minutes, creep close to him and wait for him to reemerge for a good five or 10 minutes underwater, just sitting on the sand, breathing slowly, waiting for him to reemerge. 
um, to get this shot. And you know, having a house system with its, um, you know, with my um, hundred millimeter lens on, let me do that. Um, here to a little blenny on some coral, um, just a lot of flexibility, especially for macro with a house system. Um, you know, this is a shot. Um, again, never, never could have gotten this with one of the other systems, uh, maybe with my house compact system, but it was definitely, um, you know, with an SLR, you know, an easier shot to get. This is a um, little golden tail moray. Um, I think I, I posted this one a while back. I think Linda cited this as another reason that she'll never get in the, never get in the water. Um, this guy was probably not much bigger around than, um, I don't know, than a few fingers. Um, small little guy, but um, yeah, he looks fierce head on. Um, and, um, but I, I really love shooting, um, you know, macro and close up stuff with my house system. And I actually really enjoyed shooting wide angle with my Nikona system. Um, one thing that's common no matter what, um, to no matter what system you're using is um, lighting. Um, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't really know how to use flash on land. I haven't figured it out. I tried using it this spring with um, some warblers and really just had to rely on TTL and a lot of trial and error. Um, uh, but underwater strobes, as they're called, are absolutely essential. Um, they are your primary light source underwater. Um, and the reason for that, you know, I, you know, I said light behaves differently underwater, right? Well, so remember sort of the visible spectrum of light, Roy G. Bibb. Um, you start to lose your reds very quickly, about 10 feet underwater, your reds are just absorbed because they're a very, um, they're a longer wavelength and they don't penetrate the water column. So red starts to look brown once you get below about 10 feet um, and then oranges and then yellows and so on. Um, and so everything underwater has a blue cast to it. Uh, and is very sort of monotone. Uh, and when you're diving, this is how it looks. I mean, your, your eyes know what, called, your brain knows what th certain things look like. And so it, it your, your eyes, when you're looking at stuff underwater kind of almost recreates the colors for you. But it, when you take a picture without a strobe, you realize just how drab it all looks. Um, so these become your primary light source and you rely on available light to um, sort of fill in, which is sort of the opposite where when we're shooting like outside with wildlife, it's you've got the sunlight as the primary light and you're using flash as fill. So that's, you know, something that's very much the reverse. Um, uh, you generally need two strobes because when the strobe is your primary light source, um, it's gonna be coming from one particular angle and it's gonna be, you're gonna get very harsh shadows in most cases, particularly because to avoid backscatter, um, it has to, be sort of far away from your lens coming at an angle. So uh, you generally want two strobes, um, one to sort of provide fill light, the other provide primary light. Um, and, and then you need to balance those exposures um, with the, the available light in the water column. Um, so these are a few of the different kind of popular models of strobes. Um, uh, and uh, on the back, you know, they've just got sort of your power, they, many of them will shoot TTL um, or manual and they've got exposure compensation dials and, you know, just, you know, make sure your batteries are charged before you go down. Um, this is sort of what a system looks like, um, fully outfitted system. This is, you know, a housed SLR um, with a dome port um, and the, you, these arms, um, this is sort of a very popular system of arms. Um, and called ultralight. And so you've got sort of ball arms with ball heads and, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to, um, arms with ball heads that, you know, let you reposition position the strobes at all kinds of angles and um, relative to each other and supports it. These are just basically floats to help um, support the weight of the strobe head. Um, but so you're pretty clunky when you're swimming with a house system and multiple strobes underwater. Um, that's kind of what it, what it looks like, and and this ruined it is is a little bit of overkill here. Um, probably don't need that many, but I thought that was a funny picture when I, when I was looking for a picture of the strobes. Um, probably unnecessary. Two will do you. 
So this is um, an example of what I was saying. Like if you are just sort of shooting the reef without um, without strobes, this is what you get. Uh, very blue, and this is pretty shallow. This is about 30 feet. Um, you can see there's just no color. Um, the, you really need uh, strobes to fill that in. Here's an example. Um, I don't love going through all my old bad photos to find the ones where my strobes didn't fire, which happens sometimes um, more often than um, I'd like to admit, but um, I, I found a, 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 an example of where I was shooting a subject and you know, this is this is probably 20 feet I'm at here, this pillar coral. So there is some natural light, but you see you just get this greenish blue cast. It's just flat and boring and not a picture you'd ever want to show anybody. This is the same with the strobe. And this isn't a great image either. I and I haven't sort of corrected it in Lightroom or anything like that, but just gives you an idea of wow, that's that looks brown at the bottom, right? Um brownish black and this all just looks green and that's actually like a beautiful purplish red and you get your bright red encrusting sponges and some orange and um you know much more definition uh to this and now this is actually a little overexposed like i said this isn't a great shot but just wanted to kind of give you an idea of um what it what a difference strobes make you, you can't do underwater photography without them except for some certain very specific effects um, and, and here too, this is just an example that this is another one taken with my compact. So you can see the softness in the corners, right? But, um, using the strobes really lets you sort of highlight your foreground, um, and having, this is why you need two, right? To get light on, um, to get light on, you know, an entire subject when you're shooting with a very wide angle lens. You need two strobes for the coverage and to avoid getting shadows, um, but you get incredible color that you just wouldn't have otherwise. Um, one thing this will show you too is, you see all these little speckles here, right? That's the backscatter I was talking about. Um, all the little particles in the water um, reflect the strobe light back to your lens. Um, it's worse the more, like the closer your strobe is to your lens, and so we try and put them sort of off to the side and shooting at a, you know, an angle, 45 degree angle, but you're always gonna get, particularly with really wide angle shots, you're always gonna get some backscatter. It's worse, um, you know, the in, in less clear water and so forth, but, uh, you know, these days in Lightroom, we can clean a lot of that up, or in Photoshop. Um, it used to be that you were kind of stuck with it, but battling backscatter is, you know, it's the bane of every underwater photographer's um, existence. It's just, a, you know, avoiding it, getting it out of your frame. So um, that's a little bit about kind of the equipment. Um, just talk briefly about like, if you're interested in diving, you know, um, there's certainly, you know, the, probably the most popular easiest thing is resort-based dive travel. Um, you know, unfortunately the dive operations at, you know, the popular family resorts are all inclusive tend to not be, I mean, not that they're not well run, but there's a lot of people they're shuffling through. They're really not catering to photographers. Um, you know, you're better off usually, even if you're staying at a resort that has a dive shop, there's often sort of dedicated dive resorts or um, independent, you know, dive operators that cater to photographers and offer better support for your equipment, rinse tanks for after the dive, camera tables and so forth. Um, what I really like to do when I want to do some serious photography in a great destination for a week are liveaboard dive vessels. These are boats anywhere from 80 to 120 feet um, that are specially outfitted for divers. Um, and because they're not based on land, they can get out to the more remote reefs and you have, and you have maximum time. And you're basically living on these like they're a cruise ship. Um, so it's not really something that your non-diving companion is going to love because there's not really much else to do. But if you're a hardcore diver, these will typical, the typical schedule is you get up in the morning, you do an early morning dive, you come up, you have breakfast, you dive, you come up, you have a snack, you dive, um, you come up and have lunch, have a little siesta, you dive, come up, you have a snack, you dive, have dinner, and then maybe a night dive. So you're doing like five dives a day um, on one of these. So you can get, you know, 25, 30 dives in a week. Um, 
and it's hardcore. Uh, but they're actually, the boats have gotten really comfortable. Uh, first of all, they're well outfitted for diving, camera tables. Uh, some of them have camera rooms and they've got everything you need for charging batteries and cleaning lenses and all that. And tend to have really nice um, state rooms and en suites. So uh, they're actually very comfortable, enjoyable. And um, you know, one that I'll call out because I know there's a lot of Texas folks um, who attend um, the happiness hour. Um, we actually have a local option, a live aboard out of Freeport, um, which Linda, that's right where Quintana is. Um, it's called the Fling. Um, there used to be one called the Spree too, that was a companion to it. I don't know if it, Spree is still active, but the Fling was a, is a converted oil rig crew boat and does weekend trips out to the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, which are the northernmost coral reef in, um, in this hemisphere. Um, it's a, a shallow, um, starts at about 60 to 80 feet, um, uh, which is pretty shallow for the Gulf because it's several hundred miles offshore. But it's these banks that come up to within 60 to 80 feet of the surface and actually have living coral and, and coral reef ecosystem. And so there's really cool stuff you can see in a weekend, an hour drive from Houston. And all the local shops in, in Texas sort of book it for, for weekends and you can reserve it and go with your local dive shop. Um, and there's some really cool stuff you can see in addition to the reefs um, in the uh, in the spring, you get um, uh, schooling hammerheads out there, which is can be really cool. Um, and then in the fall, um, manta rays. Um, now, unfortunately, it can be pretty rough and it's usually bad weather in the early spring and late fall. And so you gotta be pretty bold to do that. The trips get canceled a lot, but it's a really cool opportunity. And this just show you like, this is, I went on it once several years ago um, I mean, there's a queen angel fish which you expect to see in the Caribbean. Um, and it was right here in the Gulf. Um, this is a, a wide angle shot. Um, so one of the things you get to do on the, on the last day of the trip is you actually dive on abandoned oil platform. And so what this is, is actually the leg of an oil platform completely encrusted with beautiful corals, orange tube corals, sponges, um, you know, vase sponges here and all kinds of macro life. Um, you can see a damselfish here, just, just tons of life on these and they're just spectacular. And in the back, you know, like this shows you, I mean, it's these huge structures. And what this photograph doesn't show is that there's huge schools of fish um, uh, around these because they're essentially artificial reefs in the middle of, of the, the Gulf. Um, really cool diving. Um, and so this is one of my favorite um, photos of recent years, just because it's, it's sort of right here in Texas and such a cool, cool thing to do. Um, one thing I was surprised to see um, is lionfish in the Gulf. And I don't know, you know, if, if any of you have sort of, you know, seen in the, in the press over the last several years that, you know, lionfish, which used to be, you know, strictly Indo-Pacific and Red Sea, these really exotic predators um, have been released probably through the aquarium trade, you know, where people, they got too big for someone's tank and they released them and they have completely spread around the globe now. And they're now they're becoming common throughout the Caribbean. And it's really a huge problem because they have no natural predators in this hemisphere. And um, so the groupers here don't know how to eat them. And the other big fish don't know how to eat them. These are venomous spines. Um, and, but they have a voracious appetite and they just uh, vacuum up the reef fish, the small reef fish. And so it's really decimating um, native reef fish populations and it's a big problem. And so um, most, um, most destinations, all the dive resorts will have people come bring spears down. Normally you would never spear fish when diving, but they'll bring them down specifically to catch lionfish, all the lionfish they see, um, collect them. And, and they're actually excellent um, eating. Um, and so they're publicizing um, recipes for these and um, have lionfish derbies um, because it's, they're, they're bad news. They're very beautiful photography subjects, but they're bad news. Um, but other neat stuff right here in the Gulf, like this is an endemic fish to the Flower Garden Banks um, uh, golden trunk fish. Um, just a really beautiful, unique looking fish um, that only lives here. 
Um, so it's definitely, you know, it's not beginner diving by any means because it's deep and it, the visibility is not great um, and things, but it, it's, it's definitely something really cool to do right here around Texas. Uh, so uh, jumping ahead to sort of photography, pure photography considerations, um, you know, because you have such limited time underwater, you know, 30 minutes to an hour on any given dive, um, you really need to be planning what are you going to be doing on that dive? What do you want to shoot? You can't change lenses underwater. Um, although with the compact cow system, having the wet lenses, which you can actually um, carry with you underwater and put them on and take them off. It's a little cumbersome to do it, so but you can do it. But, um, you know, you, you obviously we do have zooms now, but, you know, you can't go from shooting w ultra wide angle to standard or macro on one dive because for macro, you need a flat port just because of the way optics work. And I couldn't explain it to you beyond that. And for wide angle, you need one of those big dome ports. So absent a wet lens, which has its own limitations, like I showed you with the corner softness, you've got to decide, am I going to shoot macro or am I going to shoot wide angle? So you got to talk to the dive master and ask them what you're likely to see on that dive. And you just got to make a decision and live with it. Um, you could try to carry two cameras, I don't, but good luck. Um, if you've got a, a willing buddy who will carry your second camera, I've, I've had my kids do that for me, Asian. Um, um, and even when using zooms, like you're, you might not, you can't use your entire zoom range because it has to be within the port. Um, so um, you kind of got to decide, what am I going to shoot? Um, you might think fish photography is sort of the, the, the main attraction. Um, I know in talking with Linda, she's like, that's what I would think. And it's probably what I thought too. But like I said, it, it was really hard to shoot fish um, with a rangefinder camera. Um, and it's actually now still my least favorite, um, just because you know, you need sort of a standard lens zoom range, which kind of limits you in your subjects. Um, and because fish are moving, you know, in all three dimensions, right? You know, it's not like they're even on the ground, right? You're moving up, down, forward, back, all around underwater. It's just always, it's just a challenge to get, you know, a good fish with a good background, with the right light, everything. It's, it's like, to me, it's just more, it, it, it's a lower hit rate than other kinds of, of photography. Um, and, you know, also particularly in the Caribbean, uh, abundance of fish has dropped precipitously. Um, overfishing, uh, pollution from all the development on the islands, um, loss of habitat from the pollution um, and from diver damage, and everything. The, the, the number of fish that you see on the reefs has so greatly declined over the last, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it, it's sad but there's just very few places where you get great fish life. One of them is Cozumel, actually. Um, one of them is Bonaire. There's a few places in the Caribbean that still do have great fish, but a lot of places they're just not that such great fish to shoot. Um, and the big fish that are fun to shoot tend to be pretty transient. You never know if you're gonna see them except for a few you know, well-known like a grouper or some other kind of fish that like is known to live in one particular spot and is used to the divers. Um, you know, they are more interesting to shoot when you can get large schools. Those are just rare. Um, but what I really enjoy is, is shooting large schools of fish or um, really up close, like macro detail on fish now. Um, and the other thing too, like they're moving, unlike, you know, when shooting warblers, right? And where you get a, one and you just hammer that shutter and let your burst mode go to work. Um, you can't do that underwater because your strobes have to recycle. And um, they're, they might get one to two frames per second at best. Um, so you really don't have the ability to, sh to shoot um, burst mode and, and really capture um, uh, you know, a lot of frames. Um, but I'll give you an example, this is, you know, um, you know, if you work for it, you can get some nice images, nice fish portraits. Um, it's a little four-eyed butterfly fish. Um, in, I think that was in Grand Cayman, um, spotted coney. Like I said, I like to get close up and really get detail um, on the fish and the colors and the patterns. Um, this is a stingray um, in Grand Cayman. Um, this is actually, I think, the first photograph I ever sold um, and is 
been what I mean, I think it's a nice photograph, but it, this is one of my most popular ones that um, that everybody seems to love. And I think I've sold, you know, six or eight prints of it um, back when I used to sell prints. Uh, it's really popular. Um, but I, the stingrays are, are really cool. Um, you know, just the the um, the shape and the motion that you can capture. Um, I like to try different stuff once in a while. Um, you know, when you don't have good, I, I, I did this one black and white in post just because the water was kind of green and there wasn't really good light. Um, and because barracudas, you know, are just silver, um, I just thought this was a really cool shot but made much more dramatic by going black and white. And you don't really see a lot of black and white underwater stuff because there's so such incredible color um, underwater. But it's, it's a neat thing to, to play around with. I thought the Barracuda made a really good, a really good subject for that. Um, another shot of Barracuda. Um, this is one of my favorite shots just because of how hard I had to work for this. Um, this is in the Solomon Islands. Any of you World War II history buffs may have heard of the slot um, where uh, the Japanese air base was in Rabaul in the eastern Papua New Guinea. And the American air base was in Guadalcanal, um, uh, uh, which is the southeasternmost island of the Solomons. And there's the Solomon Islands are sort of a parallel string of islands running from northwest to southeast, with Rabaul on the northwest and Honiara on the southeast. And, and so they called it the slot. And the Japanese um, uh, bombers used to fly down the slot. The American bombers would fly up the slot and they'd just do these bombing runs. And so the, um, the bay at Guadalcanal is known as Iron Bottom Sound because of how many ships are sunk there and, and airplanes and so forth. Um, obviously no wrecks in this photo, but there's a little island right in the middle of the slot called Mary Island where this, I was diving, this you know, live aboard dive boat and this just big ball of barracuda. Um, and it was over the reef. Um, and pretty close to me. And so I immediately started, you know, freaking out, like, I got to get a picture of this and I'm adjusting all my settings. I had my, you know, this was my Nikona system. So rangefinder camera. So I got to make sure I'm set to the right focal distance. And, um, and then once I said it, I got to get within that distance and you've got to get close to things underwater because the water column eats up light and also eats up sharpness. Um, so I had to be within about six feet of, I think probably even closer to this big ball of barracuda. Well, little did I realize like how quickly they were swimming um, out into the blue, like, and, and I'm just swimming after them, paying attention to absolutely nothing but the ball of barracuda on my camera and trying to keep up, kicking as hard as I can, huffing and puffing, which is generally not a good thing to do underwater. Um, and I look and I, and I, I managed to get alongside them for a few shots. I posted one this morning too from the same series, but um, was able to get the, you know close to the ball and get the sun sort of in the top right. Um, uh, it was really great. But then when I looked, when I finally sort of ran out of breath and looked at where I was, I was in the middle of the deep blue. <laughs> I had no idea where the reef was um, and uh, couldn't see anybody or anything. And um, I was just like, it's a little bit of a sensory deprivation kind of experience. And, and I had a splitting headache, which when you really work hard underwater, you get a buildup of CO2 and it can give you a pretty bad headache. And so I had to surface and sort of use my safety sausage, that, which is like a little six inch tall, six foot tall inflatable thing you fill up with air so the boat can find you. And they had to pick me up and I had to breathe pure oxygen for about an hour to get rid of the headache. <laughs> but it was worth it. I love this shot. So. Um, uh, anyway, so um, aside from shooting fish, right, like wide angle photography, I think is, is, is a lot of fun. I mean, this is where you get your, your epic um, shots, your, your grand seascapes, and I like to call them sort of riotous reefscapes, which is the color and the action. Um, you know, you need conditions to be right for it to be good for wide angle. Uh, you need good light, uh, overcast skies above water like result in just sort of flat dark water columns that are kind of boring um you want you know good 
good sunlight to help light up the water. Um, you need good visibility. Um, if, you, if it's been raining a lot and there's runoff, it'll, it'll, water, it'll get green. There's a lot of sediment in the water. Um, you know, certain destinations are known for better visibility than others, um, but you really need good vis. And, um, you know, hopefully it's not too rough just because that, again, churns um, the sediment and so forth. Um, really important in wide angle underwater to have a dominant primary subject. You know, you, you can't really do like beautiful, like distant mountain shots underwater because it's just going to look like a dark blob in the background. You've got to have a primary subject that's interesting, although you definitely do want a secondary subject. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll see diving with, with using models for that, which add interest. Um, working with models requires a lot of patience. I'll, I'll show a couple examples of that. Um, the, but secondary subjects like you know, the sun is a great one. I love using the sun as a secondary subject. Um, but, you know, fish, other divers, um, or the reef scape itself. Um, you know, the water column sort of becomes a part of your scene underwater. So you really have to account for it and what it's going to do to your composition, the color of the water, um, you know, those background elements and how visible they will be. Um, as I've said, you have to be really close to your subject um, and you're shooting wide angles. So, you know, stuff's going to fall off real fast just in the background. Um, so you can't get, you know, really detailed in the background. Um, but, um, and another challenge is when you're shooting underwater, right? Like you, you want to get the sun. I like getting the sun in the frame that results in a lot of dynamic range from the dark, you know, water looking down to the bright sun. Um, and you can't expose your bracket underwater. You're not sitting with your camera on a tripod underwater. So I, I always do exposure bracket, but you're not, you never get, you know, be able to line up your frame exactly the same. Um, so you really have to, um, you're shooting many to just see if, can I get, um, can I get one that, that, that works? Um, and now more advanced Lightroom and Photoshop techniques, you can do some blending, but it's hard because you're never going to have things lined up. Um, you've always, as I've mentioned earlier, got the risk of backscatter. Um, you might be fighting current, um, which can be great in that it helps clear out the sediment and it helps put some of the reef and the corals in motion, It'd be a cool effect, but it means you've got to be sort of swimming into the current to kind of keep yourself stable. So it can be a challenge, but um, it's, um, you know, it, it's just something you've got to be mindful of um, and also making sure you stay off the reef. Um, so shooting wide angle, again, it's, it's a commitment like that you're making in if you're going to guide a group dive, you got to keep up with people, but you want to stay in one spot so you can take some frames. So it's a challenge, um, definitely a challenge, but um, the payoff can be really great. Um, this frame is an example of what I was talking about, how if you don't have good sun and good light, you get sort of a boring shot. Um, whereas this, this sea fan is lit up and it's beautiful, but it's just sort of a boring flat shot that I haven't even really bothered to process because there's just no secondary subject and just the flat blue is kind of boring. Um, this is an example of where I didn't have a great secondary subject to work with, but, and I didn't have, you know, bright sun, but so I really sort of filled the frame. This is with my fisheye lens, but I really filled the frame with the foreground subject. Um, and it gave a nice effect of wrapping the Gorgonian around the frame. Um, and I, there, what little sun there was, I sort of got in the middle. So it kind of peeks behind the sponges. Um, so it's kind of a neat effect, um, but that's what you have to resort to, you know, when you don't have great light. Um, here's an example of using a model. Um, this was sort of a, one of the dive masters in Grand Cayman who was experienced at modeling and turned what was otherwise a pretty pedestrian subject um, into you know, kind of a neat, classic underwater shot um, with her, the arc of the diver framing the sun. Um, but just using like your dive buddy or someone as a model doesn't always work well. This is an example. This is my son who I had him sort of model for me um, with this sponge. And you can see like the legs are kind of splayed out, the gauge is hanging down. There's just 
It's not quite as graceful as Rebecca here. So uh, anyway, that's, and this is also an example, since I haven't processed, this is kind of a throwaway shot, but you can see what backscatter looks like when you're, um, you know, when you get it from your strobes. Um, getting a clean shot is a challenge. Um, you know, this is an example of using a diver, just another random diver. I don't know who this was, just someone else in the, in the group uh, swimming, swimming by. I was sort of looking for a good composition um, with this, these rope sponges in the foreground and I didn't really have a good sun as you can see. And this guy came by and just had to sort of wait for the right moment and kind of got him in, you know, a pleasing um, shape. Um, and I think it's kind of a neat shot. Um, this is an example of, you know, close focus wide angle, really filling the frame with this, the foreground with this anemone and using these divers are on the uh, anchor line doing a safety stop. And I was kind of able to position them in the corner of the frame to use them as a, a bit of a secondary subject. Um, you know, here's another example of, you know, just getting right up close to the subject, um, using the sun as a secondary subject and also the dive boat here. Um, and, but just right, right up on this red sea whip and, you know, your strobes provide this brilliant light for the foreground and, you know, balancing it with the blue water column and the sunlight, um, you know, gives a real sort of pleasing effect. Um, here's sort of one of my favorite sort of classic wide angle reef shots. Um, again, this is with the 12 millimeter fisheye lens. So this, um, this soft coral is probably, it's probably about eight feet across. And I was about two feet from it, a foot or two from it, right up the top of it, able to get the whole thing, and you know, again, um, get some sunlight in the in the corner to provide really some gradient to the water, um, and uh, you know, all the the schooling anthias around it really provide just this sense of sort of motion and color that you really only get in the great destinations in the Indo Pacific. Um, schools like this, a fish like this can be challenging though, because you get one, you know, if they get too close to your strobes, they'll get a little overexposed and they'll be very distracting or they'll be out of focus. And, you know, so you gotta, you know, it takes multiple frames to get, <laughs> to get your focus, right. Your exposure, right. Your composition, right. When you can't stay still, um, you know, is, 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 is a challenge. So you're constantly shooting. Uh, it's one of the great things about digital, right? Is it, I mean, it doesn't cost anything. Whereas in the days of film, you'd go down on a dive, you'd have a 36 exposure roll and you'd basically want to shoot the entire roll on that dive because you didn't want to go on the next dive with only half a roll of film. Um, and so, you know, 12 bucks for the film and 12 bucks for the processing later and it was expensive proposition. Um, so digital is a godsend underwater. Um, this next one is, is one of my absolute favorites and is an example of what um, you know, I'm talking about with using the sun as a secondary subject. Um, it's pretty deep here, so it's not super bright, but um, you, know, you get you know, the sun really providing that secondary, second interest and even showing a little bit of you know, the waves on top and just this riotous color um, and motion from the anthias and the, and the soft coral in the foreground. This is in the Red Sea, and this is a classic sort of Red Sea scene, but definitely, um, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that I love doing wide angle. Um, here's also from the Red Sea, you know, a little shallower. So you can see you get like a lighter color blue on the water. Um, you know, had to keep the, the main sun out of the frame and just sort of use it in the very top edge of the frame. Um, so I don't blow everything out, but, um, uh, you know, just having to always be mindful um, of the sun and, and what it's going to do to your, uh, to the color of your background um, and your composition. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you get such, you know, beautiful clear water and, and sun that I don't even want to fill in with color. And, uh, you know, this scene in the, I think this is in the Bahamas, maybe, um, just had beautiful clear water, bright sunshiny day probably 60 feet underwater and the sun was just blazing. And it made for such a beautiful water column that I really just wanted to capture, um, 
you know, sort of the shape and, and the motion of this Gorgonian, uh, which wasn't particularly colorful anyway, but I really didn't want a lot of color on it. So I just turned the strobes to really low power and really just, just kind of outline it um, and capturing the fish and the Gorgonian and the sun. Um, you know, I, I like the mood of that, of that image. Um, and sometimes when you just have really like dark water, there's no sun, not great visibility. There's other kind of creative stuff you can do if you look hard enough. Um, this is a, probably about an eight foot long uh, pink barrel sponge that was just in a really cool shape. Um, and there really was nothing else to shoot on this dive. It was just a, it was a sort of a, bland, a not a great reef and not a great day and not great viz. So I just decided to kind of, let me kind of focus on this and just, you know, light up the rim of it just kind of focus on sort of the cool shape and the color, um, you know, something more abstract, um, not your sort of typical underwater scene. Um, there's other, um, I mentioned, you know, shooting wrecks and, and iron bottom sound. Um, I did a lot of uh, wrecks. Um, you know, this is a, a, a P-51, I think, Mustang that was sunk in World War II. It's kind of cool and this I did just do available light just because your strobes could never light up the whole thing and it would so it's sort of a moodier eerie image just using available light um this is actually the guns from one of the destroyers that was sunk in the sound and you can see how it gets and, and again this is old film and I haven't processed it so there's a lot of backscatter and softness but it's a good example of like what happens to wrecks underwater get encrusted with coral and become incredibly colorful um, and magnets for fish and invertebrates. Um, and sometimes there's cool things you can do within a wreck. You don't never really want to penetrate a wreck unless it's been cleared. But like this is, I think, in Cayman or Roatan, somewhere in the Caribbean, this old fishing boat and people swimming through it. There had been water or er, sorry, air bubbles collecting in the roof of the pilot house. To where they've created like a little air pocket and so um had this diver in there and, you know got his reflection in the ceiling of the of the pilot house is kind of a, a fun thing to do so there, there's you know when you when you are diving on a wreck there's just lots of opportunities for neat compositions and things if, if you look for them um i know we're running a little bit long so i'll kind of wrap up but the macro photography is maybe as much as I love wide angle, I probably shoot macro more often because there's always something to shoot. Um, and it really is the best opportunity to focus on and highlight the incredible biodiversity of coral reefs. Um, you do need good buoyancy control because you're dealing with very small depths of field and the, you know, there's always a little bit of motion underwater. So you're moving, the corals are moving, the fish are moving, you know, you just, it, it takes a lot of patience. Um, but you do have more ability to control your subject and your framing because it's you're ta generally taking pictures of things that 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 aren't mobile, in a, in a lot of cases, or aren't moving quickly. Um, so there's a lot of really cool creative um, opportunities. Um, you know, I love just taking pictures of critters. This is just a little shrimp on um, some bubble coral. Um, nudibranchs are like the butterflies of the ocean. These are basically sea slugs. Um, they come in every different color and pattern and everything. I've got a zillion nudibranch photos. I just picked this one because it's kind of one of my favorites. And just like, who came up with that color scheme? Like, what was God thinking? <laughs> um, some fun stuff to do with fish, um, playing peekaboo with a little, um, uh, with an anemone fish in the tentacles of its host. Um, I love shooting some more abstract uh, sort of shapes and compositions. This is the arm of a crinoid, which I don't really know how to explain what a crinoid is, but it's a invertebrate that has a bunch of arms like this, it's sometimes called a feather star, filter feeds, and um, they have all different kinds of cool colors and patterns. Um, this is a close up of the arm of a crown of thorns starfish. Um, this is actually a har very harmful predator that's been decimating the Great Barrier Reef because um, these eat coral and don't have predators, um, but it made for a neat composition.
Um, sometimes when there's really not good invertebrate life, which unfortunately like the Caribbean really does lack because it's been be been so beat up. Um, you know, if you, if you look hard enough, you're creative enough. This is just like a little piece of calcareous algae called Halamita algae um, growing at the intersection of a star coral and an azure vase sponge. And I just thought it made for like a neat, you know, um, combination of color and form. Um, so just finding little things to shoot of interest. This is the uh, an encrusted overhang um, on the reef um, that wouldn't look like much without the strobes, but with the strobes, you see, wow, there's um, encrusting coral here. These are tunicates, which is actually a vertebrate, or not a vertebrate, but a the most primitive form of life that has a spinal cord. You've got encrusting sponges. Um, over here is what's called an orange ball coralomorph. Um, and I mentioned night diving. So I came back at night to this same spot to shoot that coralomorph because that's what it looks like when it's open. Um, almost like an anemone, but with bright orange balls on the end of every tip. Um, and some real close up work on that. Um, also at night, the corals open. If you remember the orange tube corals on the shot um, of, from the oil platform, this is what they look like when they're open at night feeding, um, you know, an individual polyp. Um, Close-ups of feathers, uh, feather duster worms, uh, scroll coral. You know, this is where, again, having multiple strobes, you know, being able to position them on those arms, you can really, you know, control the lighting and get great texture um, and light to really highlight some of the neat shapes of corals. Uh, this is, again, a, an open, open brain coral at night with its polyps out. Um, just kind of looks like some kind of alien something or other. Um, uh, this is the, the gills of a giant clam and it's the, and the mantle of, of a giant clam. Um, you know, I, I love focusing on sort of those abstract shapes and, and colors that when you, you can find all over underwater. Soft corals, like this is a close up of those corals from that Red Sea wide angle shot. Um, these soft corals, unfortunately, we don't have them in the Caribbean. They're only in the Indo-Pacific. Um, Red Sea and Fiji are really known for these, but just spectacular um, in every color of the rainbow. Uh, this is another one. I've got, again, zillions of these because I love shooting them, um, but they, they're just incredible colors and, and detail on them. Um, and then anemones are always popular and I think they're really cool. Um, this is the mouth of a giant anemone um, in, I think, Palau. Um, but they just, they're so varied. Um, this is one, they actually, this one was probably three feet around and um, it was sort of curled up into a ball. So just its, its tentacles were kind of coming out the very top. Um, and so this is the underside of the anemone, but just really cool texture and, and, and I love the composition of um, you know, just the little, um, the little bit of tentacles. This was a beautiful anemone that um, I just love the colors on it um, and uh, just wanted to just kind of focus just on the tips. Um, and another one with just, I mean, the colors underwater Again, it, you have to have a dive light, you, but this is why you have to have your strobes. Like, you know, things are more beautiful in, in, in photos than they are even in real life because of the, the artificial light. Um, but this is not me like using the color grading in Lightroom to swap out colors. This is what it really looks like. It's kind of one of the fun things when you're shooting underwater, your strobes go off and that flash of light and color that you get, you're like, oh, I can't wait to see that one um, when I process it. Um, so anyway, so that's it, um, and ran through a lot of stuff and I hope that, um, I hope it was interesting and, um, happy to answer any questions if anyone has any, um, I, there are a few questions in here. Um, I'm grinning because I'm going to save that to the last, but, um, there's some comments that I'm going to, that's what I mean is I'm going to save this towards the end, but, um, so. 
early on, Edidio had a question about, um, he wanted to know, are the colors enhanced by the water or lightning for, or lighting? Um, so the, the, on all the photos I showed you, those are the, I mean, the colors come, as I said, from your strobes, right? Um, uh, but I did not enhance them significantly on Photoshop or Lightroom. Actually, most of these images, except for the ones that I pointed out the shot with that housed compact system, were all shot on film. Um, if, if any of you used to shoot slide film and you knew of F Fuji Velvia, which was sort of famous for its incredible saturated colors. And it was super popular among underwater photographers because of that. Um, there's actually reefs in half a dozen locations called Velvia um, uh, in, in honor of it. Um, so a lot, a lot of the stuff was shot on Fuji Velvia, those anemone photos that I just showed, for example. And you know, all I really did in Lightroom with those was just a little bit of um, a little bit of cleanup. But those were the actual colors. Okay. Um, there, Deborah had a, a question about her camera for the entry level Canon G7 or the Sony systems. Mm -hmm. What kind of lighting do you use or recommend? Um, the same, actually, as um, as you would use for same as I use for my Nikonis, same as you would use for a house DSLR. So that's sort of one thing that's nice is. Um, you know, at least that part of your investment um, can be used if you later upgrade um, to a different kind of system or to a different camera and housing. Um, so it's generally, you know, there's, there's, there's a handful of really popular strobes underwater, um, ones made by CNC or by Icolite or by Inon. Um, and, um, you know, the strobes cost about mm, between six and $900 a piece. And like I said, you need two, so it's not cheap. Plus you need those arms, plus you need your, your sync cords or fiber optic cords. Um, but at least those can last you forever. Um, I still have all of my original strobes. I, I've replaced them just because better technologies come out, but um, you can also rent them too. That's the other thing I should mention is um, I actually don't own current strobes. I have my old big bulky ones with slow recycle. Um, but I've just, when I've gone diving the last several years, I've just rented strobes from, um, there's a couple online shops that, that will rent you this, the strobes and it's, you know, a hundred bucks to rent them for a week or something, a lot cheaper than, than investing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Elaine is wondering how much decompressing are you having to do if you are diving five times a day for a week and then getting on a plane? <laughs> Good question. So um, generally, if you're like going on a liveaboard dive boat, everyone's diving with computers. Um, dive computers that uh, either attach to your hose or, or you wear on your wrist. And they basically um, monitor your depth um, and your time throughout your dive. Um, some of them are even air integrated. Like I have one that's air integrated, so it even monitors my air consumption. And so they're constantly sort of keeping track of your nitrogen accumulation. Um, but the, uh, and they'll tell you when, you know, if you're approaching uh, no decompression limits, you know, they'll have you surface um, and tell you how long a surface interval you need. After every dive, they tell you for your ne next dive, if you're gonna go to a certain depth first, you can stay for this period of time. They're really amazing. Um, but the reality is like on those, even on the liveaboard dive boats, it's, it's pretty well, planned out for you um, to where like your first dive might be to a hundred feet for 30 minutes. And then but you come up and you have a little surface interval for an hour, um, which isn't even all that long by the time when you add in all the time, um, taking off your gear and putting, you know, resting, putting your gear back on, having a snack and you're back in. And so it kind of works out that you can do two in the morning, two in the afternoon and one at night without ever approaching no deco limits. Um, and you generally need at the end of a trip, if you've done any diving, um, you need to wait 24 hours before flying. So like you don't dive the afternoon before you leave if you have a morning flight, um, but your computer tracks all that for you and, and all the operators do as well. Okay. All right, so now this is for the fun part. 
are the comments and you generated quite a few of them. So I'm gonna second what Sue is saying. She says, what you perceive as pretty flat, I find vivid and beautiful. And I think she's referring to, and if I, correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, but one that comes to my mind was that, that red coral wave. I'm not sure what it was. It was a, a Gorgonian. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, it was a Gorgonian, I think. Yeah, you're like, oh, it's flat. I'm like, no. And and you were, you know, mentioning you need a second subject, a secondary subject. I'm like, nope, that would be that would be a keeper for me. So I was kind of giggling, going, well, can I can I just the ones that you dump? Because I, I find underwater um, things that are under the water fascinating. I'm scared to death of them, but fascinating. Um, Don Simpson says, wished I thought about this earlier in life. Some phenomenal photography, great presentation. Um, Michelle says, wow, Ben, thank you for sharing your gorgeous photography and passion for the ocean. Truly phenomenal. Mika, Thank you, Mika. She says, you need a website, Ben. And Egidio seconds Linda's statement that you need a website to feature your amazing work. And then there was a third and a fourth person that um, uh, are in unison with get a website. So I'm looking through, oh, Sue's question was the red and blue was a keeper, red plus blue. I'm not sure what that was. That might um, be that same one you were Probably the same one. Yeah, because I was just like, yeah, yeah you're like, it's flat. I'm like, no, it's not. It's gorgeous. So uh, my I was just fascinated by the fish. And uh, when you showed that slug, I'm like the butterflies of the ocean. I'm never going to see those in person because I'm not a swimmer and I'm terrified of, of, of deep water. But the, the images that you have shared with us are absolutely gorgeous. And so thank you for taking the time to dig through your ar archives, because I know, I know that, you know, it, these presentations don't just come together. There's time and there's sifting through your stuff. And um, I appreciate the time that you put into this. So um, before we close out, is there any last words you want to say? You shared a lot of stuff. Is there anything that you went Oh, I forgot to mention this that you want to throw in. Um, no, I'll just say um, I know it was a lot, so I hope I hope it wasn't overload, but um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun kind of going through um, my old archives and portfolio and picking out stuff. It's hard to sort of find ones like let me find some bad photos to show people so I can make a point. Uh, that's never fun. Um, but it was fun. I put aside the warblers for a little while to dig back into the, the fish and the coral. And yeah. um, uh, I used to have a website, as I was telling Linda before everyone logged on, um, back in the late 90s. I actually made it when I was studying for the bar exam. Um, I am a big procrastinator. So um, I spent a month like creating a website on Microsoft front page back in 97. And uh, that's actually how I sold a lot of my prints when I got it up and I got a lot of interest and um, sold a bunch of prints to restaurants and hotels and um, doctor's offices and stuff like that. And, you know, they're old Cibachrome prints, um, if anyone remembers those. And that's how I made the money to buy my housed N90S, um, which I then took with me on my post bar trip to the South Pacific where I went to the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea um, and Fiji and um, it's but you know it's just it's it's it was definitely my first love in photography was underwater stuff I still do love it it's a lot harder to uh, to get out and do it um, now because you do have to you know travel um, and schlep a lot of stuff with you but um it's, uh, it's never too late to start for anyone who's interested. Well, this is great. You know, um, like I said, thank you for, for raising your hand and offering to come in and, and do a presentation because this is, this is some, you know, photography that, that isn't for everybody, but I, I found it fascinating. And I think that you generated a lot of, you know, um, curious uh, minds of, you know, this is maybe this is something I could try. I do think that the cost of those housings is ridiculous. Yes. It that's there. Uh, there's got to be. Is there a coupon for that? That's the only way I could get <laughs> no, like into. Like I said, I I mean I'm still shooting with my um, original PowerShot G7X, um, 
in, in that little housing just because I mean it has its limitations, particularly for wide angle and and it's tough to focus on, in macro with that thing. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's a huge investment in the housing and you know now the the camera bodies every year they're coming out with a better camera body, right? It used to be in the film days, the N90S was sort of it for like, it was that or a, or the Nikon, you know, D4 for like 10 years, they didn't update it. And so you were comfortable with your housing now <laughs> constantly coming out. So yeah. you got to make a commitment and stick with it for a long time. So. Yeah, there was a little question that just popped up from the JDO. What just off the top of your head, what is a basic starter kit run? I mean, there are ways, there, there are a few um, sort of kind of what I'd call hobbyist level things. If you just want to, you know, start taking some pictures um, that I think are um, like dedicated underwater cameras and that might have a little strobe that attaches to them kind of specific to that camera where you could probably get them for a thousand bucks. Um, you can also always buy the stuff used on eBay or th even through a lot of the, the online retailers um, and b &H even sells them. Um, b &H actually has a big underwater department. Um, Adorama does. Um, there's a couple stores called, one called Mosaic with a Z, with a Z um, one called Blue Water Photo Store and one called um, Backscatter. Um, and if you go to their websites, they have really useful, very informative, like articles um, and videos on the different kinds of equipment, the different kinds of cameras, housings. They do reviews of cameras for how good are they for underwater. Um, there's an incredible amount of information um, that you can get and they all sell used stuff. You know, to get a system like, like the PowerShot system with a housing, um, you know, you could get that for um, probably 1500 new and used, you know, less. And like I said, you can rent the strobes if you want. Um, so it doesn't have to be a massive investment, um, but, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not cheap even compared to photography expenses we're used to. Right. But, but it, I mean, that's, that's palatable if you're really yeah. into, to trying that. So you it's know. definitely the way I would start before investing in right in right. a house DSLR for okay. sure. All right, then. Thank you so much. I'm going to close out this session by um, just again. Thanks for for coming on and doing this for us. You guys, you can connect with Ben on Instagram at Fins Feathers photos. And next week, Rusty Myers will be here to share his presentation on tricks to using flesh and wildlife photography. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.